All right, well, to start with, I can't see everybody, but we want to welcome everybody to this, uh, to this little session and um, about being unafraid. So to start off, the first question for you is to think about where do you hold your fear, okay? So um, where do you hold your fear? So now we're going to do a little bit of a, um, a guided imagery. So just follow along. So this is very important. So what I want you to do is put both feet on the floor, sit upright, and put your hands loosely on your thighs. Okay, now close your eyes. Try to relax, just close your eyes and think about where are you feeling any tension in your body? Could be your shoulders, your neck, your chest. Think about where you feel some tension. Then visualize that tension as a brightly colored web of energy. A brightly colored web of energy. Try to relax the part of your body that's holding the tension. As you do, imagine the colored energy moving to the palms of your hands. Now make a fist with your hands and hold the energy tightly for a few seconds. Now open your hands, palms upward, and release that energy to God as we pray. God who calms the troubled waters, we bless you for your presence in the midst of our fears and trials. We release to you the things we hold too tightly, and we trust your word of peace. Be among us in this session and may our souls and bodies be secure in you. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're gonna Hold see the, the Hold video. On Hold on a second. And we gotta to get to the right slide. Whoops. Okay. Yeah, no, it's like... We're admitting. Yeah. Good. Okay, as, as we look at the video, keep these questions in mind. What are the fears expressed by the three people in the beginning of the video? How have these fears been a part of your own life? How does the faith of the people interviewed help them confront fear? Why does Dr. Zold say that fear is clearly a gift? And what are some of the ways that Dr. Zold suggests for treating anxiety and worry? Okay. Hi, my name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the senior pastor at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection, and I'm the author of Unafraid, Living with Courage and Hope in Uncertain Times. And I want to thank you for inviting us to be a part of this conversation with you. I've got some great guests who are going to be joining me for these conversations and joining us for these conversations. And I wonder if you'd each just say a word about yourselves. Uh, thank you for the invitation. My name is Carlos Urosa. I uh, grew up in the Methodist Church uh, in Mexico City. Uh, somehow I ended up in this great country and uh, uh, through trying to jump in different vocations, uh, mm. God brought me back to, uh, to work in the church. And so today I'm serving as an, as a, as an elder in the United Methodist Church. My name is Marie King. I am a, I've been bivocational for a number of years. I'm a registered nurse. I've been also, I'm also a faith community nurse and I'm also an ordained clergy with the United Methodist Church, a deacon. And I'm Ginger Rothes, and um, I just finished seminary in May and am currently serving as a care minister at our Resurrection Downtown Campus 
and I write and teach uh, classes for our women's ministry at our Leewood campus. And I too am second career. I was a business consultant in my, my first life. Well, I am so delighted that all three of you are here as conversation partners with me. And this is a, this is a really important topic that we're covering. As we begin talking about fear, everyone struggles with fear. I've traveled around the world, no matter where I've gone, I ask people, you know, mm -hmm. do you wrestle with fear? What does fear look like for mm -hmm. you? And I've yet to find a person who says, no, I never struggle with worry or anxiety or panic or fear. I mean, we all mm -hmm. wrestle with these things. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's such a universal concern. And, uh, and it was in listening to and hearing people talk about their fears that I thought, you know, it'd be good to really spend some time researching this, studying this first as a pastor to help mm -hmm. the congregation that I serve. And then for a broader audience to really talk about how do we deal with fear? How do we mm -hmm. overcome fear? How do we live with courage in the yeah. face of our fears? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to begin by recognizing that, you know, in our lives, uh, fear is, well, fear is hardwired into us. So it's not mm -hmm. that there's something defective in us and therefore we fear. It's actually a gift from God yeah. that God has created us and our brains with the capacity mm -hmm to protect ourselves. And so on the one hand, fear is a really good gift because you know it, it, it helps us detect when there's a danger or a threat. It, it leads us to respond accordingly. And, and that's a mechanism that really protects and saves us. And not just us, but you know, all creatures, they have these defensive mechanisms. The challenge of course, is that we have a tendency to fear things that maybe we don't need to be afraid of, or we exaggerate the threat. Yeah. And then we find our brain starts telling our body to be prepared to fight or mm -hmm. flee or, or mm -hmm. to freeze. And in the process of doing that, we find that we're actually overcome by things that we shouldn't be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so the aim of this study is really to help us be able to overcome our fears mm -hmm. with courage and hope and to, um, and to look to see how our faith might play a role in that as well. So we're going to look to see what have the psychologists taught us? Um, what are the experts teaching you know, ordinary people? What do the, what do the therapists do when mm. you come in and you're overwhelmed with anxiety or fear? But then we're also going to look to see how does our faith play some role in that? And all three of you are deeply committed Christians. You are seminary trained. So we're going to look to see both how you do this in your own life, how you do this in other people's lives. And we're going to talk about various kinds of fears that we face as a society, mm -hmm. as individuals. So some of our fears are uh, very deeply personal. Mm -hmm. Some of them are fears for what's happening in our society or our world or fear of other people. And over the next five weeks, we're going to explore each of these kinds of fears mm -hmm. and see how our faith and how common sense and the wisdom of experts might help us overcome our fears. So right. I'm really excited that you're going to help yeah, us in that conversation together. And I guess I'd like to begin by remembering a story in scripture where the Israelites have been set free from slavery. I have a chapter in the book on uh, paralyzed by fear, a mile from the promised land. Mm -hmm. And the Israelites who have just been set free from slavery in Egypt are now at the edge of the promised land. Two years in, they were right a mile from the promised mm -hmm. land. They send the, the, uh, uh, the spies into the promised land. And two of them come back and say after 40 days, oh, it's awesome. We can do it. God is going to help us. And 10 of them say, we can't do it. These, yeah. we, look like, we look like grasshoppers. Yeah. And, these, and these people on the land look like giants. And, and tragically, they spend 38 years paralyzed by fear mm -hmm. a mile from the promised land. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to begin with that, with that point. And just, uh, just to ask the question, how do you see and how have you personally experienced fear either paralyzing you in life or the people that you know or care about? How have you wrestled with fear in your lives? I think that there is um, there's an element of um, with fear is that we want others to understand uh, the severity of it. In my experience, I've, I've always wanted to have like, I want you to understand why I'm going through it, how I'm feeling. Uh, and I feel like that is a, a, a little internal battle that we that we that we face that um, it often we need to we need to set aside and trying to deal with the with the root of what's causing the fear. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I felt a year away from the promised land. On my third year in seminary, um, I was so close to graduating, yes. and you know, three quarters of the way through, and was really struggling with calling. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was a fear of being in front of people, a fear of speaking oh, well, for God, a fear of preaching and influencing people. And I didn't want to mess anyone up. And um, I, I took it as a huge responsibility to be a pastor. And so um, I almost quit seminary um, mm. because of fear. And then I had to kind of reframe it. My prayer life became, God, how would you have me use this seminary education? Because I'm not seeing myself fit in this box that my friends are pursuing. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a different way that I could reach graduation or the promised land? <laughs> and for me, it became writing. Um, and it became that I would, instead of public speaking, it was 
it was public writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I still am fearful when I hit that blog post send button, but it turned into writing classes. Um, it turned into a different kind of public speaking. So yeah. I almost gave up um, paralyzed by fear, mm -hmm. um, but then needed God to help me reframe it to get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. So how about you, Marie? Were there any uh, fears that you've had since you were a kid? Maybe something you grew up fearing? I have a great fear of dogs. Ever since I was a little girl, I have always feared dogs. People say dogs won't bite, but dogs will. <laughs> <laughs> they have teeth, they will bite. So I've been afraid of dogs all my life. I've tried to do things to uh, alleviate that fear. And uh, when my friends have their dogs around, I try to get closer. Uh, taking steps towards alleviating that. And uh, for the community uh, that I was serving, I was able to have an animal blessing one year. And I didn't lay hands on, but I did get close <laughs> to good. the dog. That's excellent. <laughs> I think about how many times we've been afraid of things in our lives mm -hmm. and we, we fret about them, we worry about them, we stress about them. And uh, 140 times in scripture, we read this idea, God says, don't be afraid, or Jesus says, don't be afraid, or people are told, don't be afraid because mm. God is with you. And I wonder what role your faith plays mm -hmm. when you're afraid and how do you access that? How do you, how do you mm -hmm. come to feel that reassurance and that courage uh, from your faith? I think for me, it's um, it's a deep breath and a recognizing God's presence. Um, it's a pause. Um, my faith is based on I know God is with me and a presence to tap into always. And um, it's not about doctrine or dogma as much as God, mm -hmm. we're in this together. Get yeah. me through this moment, or I surrender it to you. Um, and that's where my faith in I'm not alone, mm. I think, is really my foundation. Yeah. For me, it's been first presenting my concerns to God and praying about whatever the assignment is before I accept it. And that, that empowers me. I know that I can do all things at Christ through Christ who strengthens me. So reminding myself that that God is there with me and present with me is part of the structure of my faith that gets me through. I love that. Yeah. I wanna wrap up this conversation uh, together by talking about facing your fears. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in the book, my daughter, Danielle, who said uh, she, while she was in college at Kansas State, she decided to take a skydiving class. She joined the skydiving mm -hmm. club. And as a father who tried very carefully to protect my baby her whole life, I was glad she didn't tell me in advance she'd done this, but you know, we're at lunch and she's telling me, it's like, what? What were you thinking? You jumped out of an airplane voluntarily? What are you, you know, and, and I said, why did you do this? And she said, I knew that I have a tendency towards being afraid. And I thought if I did the scariest thing I could think of and I survived, I wouldn't be afraid anymore. And, uh, and I have this wonderful picture of her and it's a little blurry. It was taken, you know, right after the, right after she got down on the ground, she's got this huge smile on her face. And it's like, she had just overcome the world and uh, overcome all of her fears in one moment. And so that idea of facing your fears and overcoming them, what, what therapists call exposure therapy. I wonder if there's any way that you've done that too, that you might want to share. When I was in my second career um, cooking in the kitchen, on my mm -hmm. second day of my, of my job, uh, I was kind of working one of the areas that didn't require being close to the fire or going to the high paced uh, work. And um, the sous chef had have gone through a situation. He started getting sick and I was called up to say, you're up. And I didn't know much about the, the recipes or like, or the things, it was the process. I think for me, it was, it was the fear of like, no, knowing the process. It didn't mean that I didn't feel fear, but in that moment, I just had to go for it and just jump right in it. And uh, uh, I burned myself a couple of times, but at the end, it wasn't that bad. And yeah. I think it kind of uh, allowed me to, to keep moving forward in that area, so. I think that's what we discover when we face <laughs> our fears with faith is we find it's not usually as bad as we think it's gonna be. And then suddenly we find a new courage and strength. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your insights and your fears and being willing to talk about those things here. And this is going to be a great five-week study. Thank you so much for being a part of it. 
In each of our sessions, we're going to have an expert interview, and I'm really excited about our first expert. He is Dr. David Zald. He's professor of psychology and psychiatry at Vanderbilt University. And uh, there, as a neuroscientist, he studies the brain, and he's going to help us understand uh, how the brain works, and in particular, the connection between the brain and fear. Dr. Zald, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us today. Happy to be here. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about, uh, about fear and the brain. How, why do we fear, and is, what role does the brain play in fear? Yeah, so there is just a key role here for fear because if we don't have it, we probably die. And if you just think of the range of threats that we have every day we go outside, you know, you can get hit by a car, something, you can fall down, you can injure yourself. You have to learn how to avoid those injuries. And the way we do that as mammals is that we develop fear. So we have to have fear. It's in some ways essential for us as a species. Yeah, tell us about the anatomy of fear. What's going on in the brain and, and how does it work? There are some specific brain regions that we really pay attention to when we're thinking about fear. One of them, which you mentioned in your book, is the amygdala. And this is a small almond-shaped area that's in your temporal lobes. It's deep in there. It's in many ways an, an old structure in terms of its development in mammals. And this ends up being not the only area involved in fear, but it's really essential because it's at sort of the nexus, it's at the intersection of a whole range of motor, attentional, cognitive, and physiological responses. And it's those physiological responses, though, that we often are most aware of. Our heart beating, going boom, boom, boom. Our feeling like we're breathing hard or even having, like we can't breathe. Having our hands get clammy. Um, all these physiological responses can get triggered by the amygdala to give you that immediate knowledge, that physical knowledge that something's wrong. It both cues you to that, it also is preparing you for what actions you might need to take. For instance, you know, you may be in a situation where what you need to do is run and run as fast as you can, and what it's doing is setting you up to be able to do that, so that you're attending to what you need to attend to, and that you're making that the priority, and then you're able to take whatever action it is you need to get safe again. So fear clearly mm -hmm. is a gift. I mean, it's a blessing to us that we have this capacity to do this. Where does it go wrong then? Because uh, there's a lot of us out there who struggle with fear and it's not over something that might harm us. We, we just find ourselves paralyzed by fear or overcome by fear. So what are, the, what are the ways in which you can overcome that or you treat that? So there are a few different ways. One of the biggest is to get the person actually doing the very thing they're anxious about. I once worked with a patient who was afraid to hold a knife and, and the fear was that she, if she had that knife that she might hurt someone with it. But by never holding that knife, she never learns that she can do it. And you say, well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I might stab you. Okay, let's say this is not going to, you're not going to stab me. What else? Well, I might go crazy. And you're like, okay, well, let's just test that. Mm -hmm. Let's actually test whether you can do this for a few minutes without going crazy. Once she learned that, then she could go another step and then another step. And that really ends up being an essential part of any attempt to get fear and anxiety under control. Excellent. Um, how about worry? Worry is another form of fear that doesn't seem quite so serious as anxiety, and yet, and yet there's a whole host of people, in fact, a, a large number of people in our society carry a measure of worry with them. How, how does that play into fear and, and the brain physiology, and how do you overcome that? When we're talking about the worry, it's often that we get it can get stuck on. It's not bad for us to worry about some things. The problem is when it gets stuck. And one of the ideas that's out there in the literature is that there are certain parts of the brain where we get loops, where one part of the brain 
projects to another part, and then that projects to another area, which projects back to the original one. Interesting. And so we often think that these loops can get into sort of a feedback mode, where once it starts, it's just circling around, like when you have a guitar, electric guitar, and you start feeding back your guitar against an amplifier. Well, this same sort of circuitry can get going in a person, and then it's it can be really a challenge to turn it off. And in fact, a lot of what has to be done in working with people who have that sort of chronic worry is getting them to learn some techniques for being able to channel it differently. Dr. Zoll, this has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And I wanna say that this is our, the end of our first session. We've got a great journey ahead of us as we're studying how we can live unafraid, not without fear altogether, but how we can live unafraid with courage and hope. I look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>
I mean, Dr. Zold said that um, we need to jump in and do the very thing that we're anxious about. And I think that's what we all hesitate on doing. But when we have that faith and we do jump in, you feel that calmness coming over you. Right. And the worry, he said to learn a technique to channel it differently, but he didn't share on what a technique was. And which I wish he did because I could definitely use them once in a while. It feels that's, like the thing, like he was using the example of a loop. That's exactly yeah. what it is. It just yeah. moves in your head. And no matter what you could be doing, I could read a whole chapter and not absorb anything. Just that thing is still going through my head. Right, right, right. 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 Yeah, I think in the next session, they get a little into uh, cognitive therapy, which is just kind of ways to change those that thought, that constant thought pattern, you know, to kind of shift that. Right. Into, yeah, into you have to have too. something to look forward to in the next four sessions. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, now I have a volunteer. See, I have a volunteer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what am I to read the first two chapters. In, in the book, chapter one. The first two oh, paragraphs. Paragraphs, paragraphs. The first two paragraphs. The chapters yes. will okay. take a while. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. In 1947, W.H. Auden published his Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Age of Anxiety. If the post war 1940s and 1950s was the age of anxiety, ours might be appropriately deemed the age of high anxiety. We can hardly overstate the extent to which worry, anxiety, and fear permeate our lives. We worry about the future, about politics, and about our health. We fear violent crime, racial divisions, and the future of the economy. Deep rifts in our nation leave us with an increasing sense of uncertainty. Fear in the financial markets can wipe out billions of dollars of wealth in a single day. Our fears in the form of insecurity often wreak havoc on our lives and personal relationships. Google fear and you'll find, oh, you'll find over 600 million websites in a point 98 seconds. Wow. Yeah. yeah so, imagine if you took two seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Wow. You know, it's interesting because he wrote this book, uh, not, you know, not within this past year. So if you look at the question, what are the aspects of contemporary life that make people fearful? It's funny you mentioned that because when I read that first paragraph, the first thing I did was look at the copyright date. Yes, yeah, so yeah. did I. I did. <laughs> right. Next, it's funny. Yeah. 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 Right. This was written before COVID. And, but the thing is, yeah. the age, the age, right? But the age of anxiety started back in the forties and fifties when the whole Cold War started. And how was it? The media at that point had started expanding and and telling people that oh, to be fearful. I mean, I remember as a kid being under my desk in school. Yes. yes. Right. Right. And, and and if you read the media today, there's not anything positive. Oh, this is going to happen because this is going to happen. We right. need positive. Positive is so much that that's uplifting. That makes people more um, productive. All this well, just, look at Washington D.C. right yeah. now, which has become yeah. a military camp. Exactly. You know, out of fear, fear. Yeah. 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 Some of it may be grounded, but there's no specific threats. But there's a lot of fear. Yeah. yeah. And it's in every aspect of our lives. It's not oh, it is. one aspect. It's it's and yeah. it's not only here. It's around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's actually the fear of un the unknown. You know, exactly. you don't know what's going to happen. So that's a big piece of it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the thing is, at that point, at that point, also we have to remember God's promise. And but it's that's that loop we keep going through where we we. We have God's promise here, but we have the fear that seems to keep growing. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now, in chapter two, Hamilton says that fear may play a role in keeping us safe, which I think, you know, we all can understand that. Does anybody have a time that they can think about fear keeping you safe from something? Do 
the other side of fear. I, I remember when my middle son was young and I tell them, don't touch that, it's hot. And he didn't listen. He learned the hard way. So he learned that, that fear about hot things. So he associated that, it just sticks in my mind. And mm -hmm. how children have no fear and, you know, and remember that whole thing during, um, gosh, was it the 80s? No fear was written across everybody's t-shirts. Mm. It's just, we, we kind of bounce around these things, but fear is important. I yeah. mean, if a dog, a dog comes charging down the road at you and, and it's frothing, yeah, you should be afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I guess be fearful of things that you have some control over that could cause you physical harm or your loved one's physical harm. Right, right, in terms of how you do things, right. But Hamilton also identifies false fears and unhealthy worries as things that keep us from living well. So let's see, does anyone willing to share when they've experienced fear as something that kept you from living well. <clears throat> well, what about right now? Fear is keeping us from living well, where our mental stability is not well at all. And mm. fear, fear had me um, quarantine my own husband because he had congestion over the weekend, because I'm so afraid of getting sick and then bringing it to my job right. that I wasn't as rational as I probably would have been if I wasn't working in a healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. um, right. So yeah. it's it's really affecting more so than I'd like to believe my mental well being. Right. Mm -hmm. That's like I said to Dee before when I was in church Sunday and my daughter came and sat next to me. I was kind of like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I didn't go to church. I had to watch it on Zoom because I was afraid that my husband was sick. Right. Meanwhile, we were both negative, but still that fear stopped me from living and stopped me from living well. Right. My grandchildren were sick last right. week and I, I avoided going over their house for a whole week because the two kids were sick. And my daughter even took them to the doctor and had them tested, but it was negative, you know, but they did just had colds. But right. you're afraid of, of, you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know, we're not socializing, which is a big part of our mental stability. Right. And, you know, when people think of living well or living healthy, the mental aspect of it is, is not always thought about. It's always your physical well-being. But to me, the mental aspect is the key. And we're all not in a good place right now. I'm right. sure we're yeah. all having right. that, that feeling. Right. So we're all scared to do anything. Right. You're scared to right. go out. You're scared to do, you know, socialize. Right. Frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. And when you can't do something and you're frustrated, that you you have other things that start. I mean, that that mm -hmm. become more more anxiety. Right. Because you you're kind of eating away at your own self because you're frustrated. Right. 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 Yep. So in talking about the promise of this book in chapter one. Hamilton expresses confidence that we can learn to address our fears, control them, and learn from them. What tools do you already have that help you deal with your fear? And what are your hopes for this study? Hmm. Did you just say what tools do we have? Yes, yeah, to yeah. help you deal with your fear. <clears throat> we definitely have the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's a that's not just you know it's a tool to be used I think so yes in the, in the Bible it says be anxious for nothing, nothing. right by right. prayer and supplication let your requests be known to God and edge talking let um hold it back yeah go ahead. Yeah, you live much better if you hold on to that. Yeah. Well, even in Psalm 23, right? Yeah. He reminds us, you know, like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So he he fights our battles. He we have to, but as people, we forget 
And that's why the word of God says we need to remind each other daily of these things. So we mm -hmm. need to remind ourselves. We have to remind yeah. ourselves also. Yep. Yes. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So not only do we remind each other, but by reading that, we, we, we're we reminded, oh, he's right here. He loves me. He's... But how often do we forget that? Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's a constant yeah. reminder. We constantly have to remind ourselves that, yes, God is with us. But, and, um, yeah, I don't have that problem. I simply look outside, and, and even I look inside. This is the magic of God displayed through the human ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ability of man to, to create the pyramids mm -hmm. is the direct result of God's input to their minds they didn't create this on themselves I, I've used the, the seed mm -hmm. to, to display this at times and said you know all of the collective wisdom of the entire human race cannot create that seed mm. so but God created that don't seed. believe in God you're a fool because you can't create a seed. Yeah, right. <laughs> One little seed. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that it, one of the things that occurs to me is that um, sometimes, especially now after a whole year of this, uh, uh, people are feeling lonely and isolated, and uh, you know, and when it's those are. Those are descriptions of what is going on, but it doesn't really, uh, they're really not feelings. The feelings that uh, may go with that are fear mm -hmm. and anxiety. So when you're, mm -hmm. when you're alone, when you're isolated, it's much more likely that you would be vulnerable to fear and anxiety because there's nothing to bounce off of. Yeah. It's uh, just keeps bouncing off in your, your own head, as you said, you know, mm -hmm. so. It's um, so one of the ways of dealing with uh, that fear is is to uh, find ways to break that isolation and to reach out beyond yourself and to get out, you know, and reach out to those who are um, particularly um, captive to loneliness and so on. People who are isolated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now um, we're going to talk about the Israelites. And do you have? We don't really have the Bible. Yeah. Do we need a Bible? What? Um, we have it in the next. We have it in the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead to the next slide, and then we'll go back. Okay. So oh, this is go. yeah numbers thirteen thirty two to thirty three. Do I have a volunteer to read that? Go out there. Again, I'll read it. The of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. Mm. And all the people whom we saw in, the, in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come from the giants. And in our eyes, we were like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. Okay, so let me go back. So what were the fears that kept the people from entering the promised land? They thought the people were giants. Yeah. Right? They thought that the people were bigger than they were. Right? And that they wouldn't, uh, they'd be killed. Right. 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 But why do you think this, the people listened to the 10 pessimistic spies rather than the two pot spies who assured them that God would be with them? Because it was the majority, the majority mm. of the spies that went out. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, too, I, I think that in us there's kind of a tendency to, to believe a lot of times in the negative. You know, if you're in a group of people and, and one person comes up with a, a negative thing about it, a lot of times everybody, you know, kind of jumps on that. 
I, I right. part of a, a tendency. Um, I think it really depended on the personality traits of the 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but I think it's the person that's negative is all is also could be presenting their own fear or fears because mm -hmm. they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 But the people listen to them rather than than the two who, who said that God was with them. Well, that's again, that's yeah. the status quo is safer than reach, you know, looking to a new route or a new road. Right, right. So Hamilton says a little later in chapter three that our visions of a promised land or of the future we would like to see can be clouded by our assumptions about the risks and dangers involved so that we can become paralyzed by obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the next question. Right, so when have you seen a group become paralyzed by risks and dangers? When have you been paralyzed by risks and dangers? Like, hmm. yeah, COVID. COVID, yeah. 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 Yeah, there are people, you know, in our church that I haven't seen for a whole year. Right. And I, you know, I've been to church a lot in the past year, but uh, I've, there are a lot of people I haven't seen. Uh, and afraid. Yeah. Paralyzed by risks and dangers. But that's that's a little bit more of a almost like a healthy fear, you know, I think for, for some people. You know. Yeah. But there are some people who haven't come out of their house now for a whole year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's more like being paralyzed. Yeah. That's true. There's someone else. Somebody, oh, Lisa. Yeah, it's Lisa. She must have had a new app. All right, I'm going to go back into the shared screen. Here we go. Come on. Here we are. Okay, so visualize the situation of the Israelites of, as they sat one mile from the promised land wow. for how many years? Like 38, 38 years. years. Yeah, 38 oh my gosh. Years, yeah. That's how long I've been here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what hopes and dreams has, has the Israelites had for the land? And what would their lives be like as nomadic people living in the wilderness? Wow. Well. Mm. Well, they weren't yeah. able to establish themselves and, and yeah right well, they could sit there and complain that god didn't fulfill his promise and moan and bemoan and and say you know this is you know should have had should have happened should have would have could have kind of situation instead right. of listening to what god says they listen to themselves which is not the right thing to do and mm -hmm. they suffer for it right I'm sure they uh, wanted to, you know, it had, had the hope of being able to settle down mm -hmm. and have a piece of property that they live at and uh, mm -hmm. a house and all the things that go with a place to live and be able to raise a family and all that. Uh, and all that had to do with the land mm -hmm. where they would be. Yeah. But instead they were nomads. Hmm. All right, let's move on. Was that a form of penance? For the Israelites? Because mm -hmm. in early times they worshipped idols. And, and I wonder if that was not a form of penance that God placed before them. Sure. Before he would give them the promise. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. That's probably a good way of describing it. Yeah. yeah, 38 years, 40 years in the wilderness. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay, so Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. 
So what does this definition of faith tell us about the nature of faith? Yes. There's something wrong with the translation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Faith is the reality. Faith is the reality of what we hope for. The evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. The evidence of things not seen. Hmm. Well, we hope we we hope for Jesus to come back to get us, and although we don't see him yet, we still believe. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it it hasn't stopped us from continuing to share the message of the cross. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of, you know. Right. That we don't, we can't see faith. You know, it's um, it's something that we feel, but it's nothing. I don't think that we can put our, you know, it's not concrete. Right. I know, but we see faith in others, though. Sometimes that's right. what I have trouble with that. Yes. With the faith, right. you know, faith is the word, but I see faith in people and and in their actions all yes. the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You know, and I think that that talks about the nature of faith. Uh, it, it's definitely an intrinsic feeling, and um, it's something that you acquire. I don't think you you get it right away, mm -hmm. and um, I think we constantly build on that faith. Yeah. It's it's like the king. I think it's like the kingdom of God. <clears throat> right now, you don't see a physical kingdom, but you experience that kingdom. And this is just my own personal opinion. When in other Christians, right, having fellowship with other Christians and and having you know doing for one another, you experience the kingdom of God. So we're not seeing it in a physical, but we are experiencing it. You experience it in, in right. other people every day, right? Well, what right. you're seeing through other people, and I think what Ed, Ed said is you experience when you. Just look outside and you see the world right, and, right. and you see everything um you're experiencing it right. even though yes through those through things through things right, right? i wonder both your people faith, the word faith could be also be used as trust mm -hmm. sure yeah. mm -hmm. well that, that verse go, okay so if we read on i'm going to read it out of the esv Okay. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendations. And by faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that, is what, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So it's just like he's saying, you see God in creation. Um, right. Right, and that's, in people. That's, that's what and in people. Hmm. That, the, that the word is what becomes the reality. We live in God's word. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. In chapter three, Hamilton talks about one aspect, aspect of faith as trust or confidence that things will get better despite whatever circumstances we face in the current moment. Now, how does this definition compare with the definition in Hebrews 1.11? In what ways is it different? Hmm. 111 or 111? 11, 11, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. It says 11.1. 11.1. Okay. Yeah, they have a type on the confidence things will get better whatever circumstances we face in the current yeah, that's, that's an insane statement. <laughs> it really is. That things will get better. Yeah. You no, know, one aspect of faith as trust or confidence that things will get better doesn't make any sense. You either believe or you don't. 
Mm. And if you believe, then that's the aspect of faith. And trust comes automatically. Not that things will get better. Right. Uh, you either have faith or you don't. <laughs> right. And I, I think, too, it's maybe not always that things will get better because I don't think that they always do get better. But one aspect, I guess, of faith is that God is always with us. Right. In whatever, whatever, whatever it happens. Right. Right. The world is made up of what you believe. Each of us has a belief structure in our mind. And that's what makes up our world. We're sitting here because of something we believe in. And, and if we mm -hmm. didn't believe it, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yep. So that's what makes us uh, step forward, uh, anticipating that, that, you know, we've got a reason to step forward. There's something mm -hmm. there for us. Mm hmm yeah. All right. So then he has this, this acronym as a tool for confronting fear. Um, face your fears with faith. Examine your assumption in light of the facts. Attack your anxieties with action. And release your cares to God. So what about these four steps seems unclear right now. Which seems most difficult to you and why? Sorry about that beeping. I don't know what it is. That was me. <laughs> now I got beeping going on in here too. Oh, oh. I, you know what? I had difficulty. Like one of the things that I just recently experienced was, um, and I had a lot of anxiety about it. Was getting this vaccine, and I, um, yeah. I had a breakdown, and I reached out, but then I, I examined the assumption in light of the facts. So I called people that were in the medical field and I asked them a thousand questions. And then I was like, okay, that was one part of it. Then I prayed a lot on it. I mean, I cried and I prayed and, and I kind of like released my cares to God. I'm facing my fear with faith by getting it tomorrow, by putting it in God's hand. So I'm also attacking my anxiety with that action. I made the commitment, I filled it out the consent form. So tomorrow when I actually sit in the chair and get that needle, I will face my fear with faith because my biggest fear of getting this is what will happen to me, um, what can happen to me because it's new. And you know, I, I don't wanna be a guinea pig, so to speak, but um, I figured I just, you know, the opportunity is there for me to receive it um, after, careful contemplation and facing it I, I lifted it up to God and I said okay if this is where you want me to go I'm going and uh, I know you'll be with me whatever the results if it affects my body in a certain way I know that God will be with me so I kind of like did confront all four of these but if you would have asked me that last Tuesday I would have been stuck on all four of them so yeah. it, it does help when you look at it like this good thank you yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think too, and, and you know, the other thing he points out in the book too, he has the whole example of the man who, who loses his job and everything like that too, is, is being able to break things down rather than just being coming overwhelmed with your fear, you know, being able to, you know, step back and, and, and break it down mm -hmm. and what can you do and, you know, what are, what are assumptions, true or false? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an acronym he'd like us to remember. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So Philippians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. So beautiful. What promises are contained in these verses? 
What is You'll it? have the peace of God. Right. Yep. The promise. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. But God will hear your prayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like God will hear them. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yep. What is near? Yep. yep. So what impact does this statement have on our lives? Yeah, the God is with you through all these circumstances. You know, we have to have trust. We have to have yeah. faith. We have to have trust. We have to have, have to have confidence that God is going to get us through these trying times. Right. There were always trying times. There was always trying times. Right. You know, we, there were trying times yeah. before the pandemic. Right. Trying and, times go back to Adam and Eve. Absolutely. That's <laughs> right. That's right. But rather than, than being overwhelmed by it, you know, it's giving us an uh, action of something to do, you know, to bring it up to God in prayer. Right. You know. Don't be anxious about anything. Right. And right. that's, that's, right. that's what I had to keep uh, looping in my head. Don't be anxious about anything. Yeah. You know, you, the yeah. answer is not always going to be what you want sometimes. Mm -hmm. God will get you through that. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's been many times in my life that, you know, things didn't always work out the way that I wanted them to. But God walked me through those trying times. And God was always there. You know, we, we don't always know what the outcome is going to be, but we have to have faith that God will get us through it, even if the outcome isn't what we want. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. We make a mistake of believing that we know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I don't know what the future is going to be. Nothing. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I have to trust that God is walking there beside me all the time. There are only one set of footprints yep. in the sand. Exactly. Yeah, there exactly. You go. Yep. Right. Yeah. The first sentence right. is the key. The Lord is near. Yes. Ah. Oh, yes. Yes. Right. Kabbalah says the Lord is everywhere and nowhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm slowly studying more and more of the Kabbalah and how it uh, mm -hmm. views the world, how it saw it from ancient times to today. Wow. Uh, it's fascinating. Wow. All right. Oops, I'm sorry. He, he also um, talks in the book there's not, about praying the scriptures. Um, had, did anyone read that and have any uh, have experience with that? Where you kind of talk to God through, through scriptures? Yes. I have prayed the Psalms. Okay. How, how does that work? Because the Psalms will calm you down. There's a lot of psalms that, that um, and I can't think of any off the top of my head, but um, I've had a lot of anxiety over my life. And I will go to the psalms and I will read the psalms and pray those. Okay. And, hmm. and those. Um, Psalm 46. Yeah. Right. God is my refuge and strength. Very exactly. present help in trouble. Okay. And, and it has calmed me down and, and helped me. Um, and will calm my fears and help me sleep. Okay. Wow. So Thank yeah, I, I do the Psalms a lot. Okay. And he also suggests in here to reflect on a physical reminder of God's presence and the call to prayer. Perhaps the reminder is a piece of jewelry, a wristband, or a cross placed in a prominent spot in your home. Maybe it's an actual, where he talks about the thunder shirt for the little dog that's afraid of the thunderstorms. Right. Mm -hmm. A sweatshirt or sweater you can wear for prayer time. Maybe it's a chair or a corner devoted to prayer and Bible reading. So, you know, what they're asking is to, in some way, follow on this visualization by locating or creating a physical reminder and use it during the course of study to observe how it affects your approach to the fears and relationship with God. So that's something to think about for next week. 
Sure. Um, if you, you know, if you come across something that helps you focus on mm -hmm. that. So I guess it's time to, to close with prayer. Mm -hmm. So let's, we can, um, we can pray together, the closing prayer. Mm -hmm. God of peace, peace. You know our fears, you know our fears before we have fragile our faith. You know how fragile our struggles are to trust you more. Our faith is our faith like a mustard seed in a fearful world. world. We pray. Amen. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Everybody stay Thank safe you. and unafraid. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. See you next yeah. week. Yep. Yep. Okay. Chapters five okay. through eight. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It was good. Bye. Thank you. Tom, say goodbye. Tom, say goodbye. You had a doctor's appointment. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 So long. Yeah. Very good. Good question. Yeah, well, yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. good session. Good session. Yeah, he does a good job.